Good day, everyone. Welcome to the earnings call for Western Alliance Bank Corporation for the first quarter of 2020. Our speakers today are Ken Vecchioni, President and Chief Executive Officer, and Dale Gibbons, Chief Financial Officer. You may also view the presentation today via the webcast through the company's website at www.westernalliancebankcorporation.com. The call will be recorded and made available for replay after 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern, April 17, 2020, through May 17, 2020, at 9 a.m. Eastern, by dialing 1-877-344-7529 using the passcode 101-42009. The discussion during this call may contain forward-looking statements that relate to expectations, beliefs, projections, future plans and strategies, anticipated events or trends, and similar expressions concerning matters that are not historical facts. The forward-looking statements contained herein reflect our current views about future events and financial performance and are subject to risks, uncertainties, assumptions, and changes in circumstances that may cause our actual results to differ significantly from historical results and those expressed in any forward-looking statement. Factors that could cause cause actual results to differ materially from historical or expected results are included in this presentation, the related earnings release, and our filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Except as required by law, the company does not undertake any obligation to update any forward-looking statements. Now for the opening remarks, I would like to now turn the call over to Ken Vecchioni. Please go ahead. Good afternoon and welcome to Western Alliance's first quarter earnings call. Joining me on the call today are Dale Gibbons our, and our Chief Credit Officer, Tim Bruckner. I will first provide an overview of Western Alliance's response to the coronavirus pandemic. And then Dale will walk you through the bank financial performance. Afterwards, we will open the line to take your questions. I'll begin by laying out Western Alliance's approach to the COVID and economic crisis. First and most importantly, I hope that everyone on the line is doing well and that your families and loved ones are safe and healthy. These wishes are especially extended to all the care and safety workers actively putting themselves in harm's way to protect our communities. At Western Lines Bank, our people remain healthy and engaged, and despite the vast majority working from home for the last month, continue to go above and beyond the call of duty to serve our customers and, and the communities we operate to navigate this challenging time. Our business continuity plans have been working as anticipated, and I am proud of the entrepreneurial spirit our people continue to demonstrate to get the job done and develop unique solutions for our clients. First, I'd like to lay out the business actions Western Alliance has taken in light of the evolving environment. Although we did not anticipate the widespread severity and likely duration of the virus, we did start assessing potential risks and mitigants as early as mid-January, and as the breadth of the pandemic became apparent, we accelerated implementing plans in mid-February to prioritize asset quality, capital, and liquidity management. We have since divided the business into appropriate risk segments led by senior managers with deep credit and workout experience to monitor and foster early engagement with our borrowers and begin the necessary credit triage process. For example, Robert Sauber is leading the hotel franchise group, while I am leading the warehouse lending and gaming groups. Dale has corporate finance, and Tim Bruckner coordinates overseas and directs all credit activities. Our overall risk management approach is focused on establishing individual borrower-level borrower strategies in which we are proactively engaging in customer conversations to evaluate and agree upon financial plans focused on liquidity management to conserve resources in anticipation of an elongated economic downturn. To date, we have had direct dialogue with all borrowers with over $3 million in exposure, or 86% of our portfolio, and substantial dialogue below this level. We assume that all borrowers will have some level of COVID-19 impact and are focused on evaluating our borrowers' remediation efforts, access to capital, and contingency plans. We're also very pleased that Congress and the entire federal, federal government came together to expeditiously pass the CARES Act and stimulus measures a few weeks ago, 
Additionally, we applaud the Fed's actions to reduce interest rates, support liquidity in the financial markets through quantitative easing for a wide variety of asset classes and provide support for small and medium-sized businesses through its innovative new lending programs. We recognize that the SBA has a large task in front of them, and I'm extremely proud to say that our people work tirelessly with them so that we could successfully process uh, the Triple P program, loans on the first day. We have dedicated over a quarter of our workforce to avail our clients of this important program and have successfully approved over 2,600 applications, totaling $1.5 billion to date. We anticipate funding approximately $150 million per day. As part of our broader risk management strategy, we have prioritized implementing the Triple P program as the most expedient method to quickly to quickly get incremental liquidity to our clients. Furthermore, we believe that the newly initiated Main Street Lending Program, when implemented, provides incremental liquidity for our large clients as well as Triple P participants. Our approach to loan modifications and deferment requests is to look for resourceful ways to partner with our clients, along with assessing their willingness and capacity to support their business interests. We are asking our clients to work hand-in-hand with us for long-term solutions to hopefully short-term challenging environment whereby our clients contribute liquidity, capital, or equity as an integral component to loan modifications. Our longer-term solutions-based approach distinguishes us from industry-standardized 90-day deferral programs. Our approach collectively uses the resources of the borrower, government, and the bank's balance sheets to develop solutions that extend beyond six-month window provided for in the CARES Act. This negotiation process has likely slowed our modification pipeline as approximately $400 million has been processed to date. We learned during the last downturn when both the borrower and the bank use their resources to bridge the gap, it generates a mutually favorable outcome. With all this as the backdrop, I'd like to walk through our financial performance for the quarter. Despite the uniquely challenging operating and rate environment, I am proud to report that in the first quarter, Western Alliance generated $163.4 million of operating pre-provisioned net revenue, up 10% year-over-year and 3% quarter-to-quarter. We continued with the adoption of CESOL accounting changes this quarter, which resulted in a provision for credit losses of $51.2 million for the quarter, 47% of which was driven by our robust balance sheet growth. Dale will go into more detail in a bit on how the unique features of CESOL drove our provisions, but our ACL to funded loan ratio now stands at 1.14%. Wall generated net income of $84 million, or 83 cents per share, and tangible book value per share was $26.73. This quarter, we produced a NIM of 4.22% and had net recoveries of $3.2 million and continued to improve our our operating leverage. Even with our increased vigilance, organic balance sheet continued to be healthy in Q1 for both loans and deposits. Deposits grew $2 billion to $24.8 billion as we gained market share in several of our key business lines as well as traction in one of our recently launched deposit initiatives, which added over $400 million. This highlights the continued strength of our diversified funding channels and overall deposit franchise to generate stable, low-cost liquidity, irrespective of the macroeconomic environment. Continuing on our strong momentum from 2019, total loans increased $2 billion to $23.1 billion. Approximately $1.5 billion of this was through organic loan growth from new client projects, and another $500 million was credit line drawdowns, of which approximately half was redeposited into the bank. Let me take a moment now to make a few high-level comments on Western Alliance loan portfolio. We believe that our well-diversified business model and purposeful decisions made over the past decade regarding conservative underwriting criteria and sector allocations positioned the portfolio to withstand the current economic environment. At quarter end, asset quality was stable with a decline in totally adverse graded loans and Oreo to assets of 1.2% from 1.27% in Q4. Western Alliance has no direct energy or large retail mall exposure. We stopped making loans to the quick service restaurant sector several years ago uh, with current exposure of only $150 million. 
Our construction and land and development portfolio is now under 9% of our loan book. In our institutional lot banking business, which makes up 30% of the CLD portfolio, we have not received any deferral requests at this time. Single-family residential construction, which composes another 27%, was still experiencing positive absorption trends through March. However, April's traffic has fallen off. The portfolio is extremely well positioned coming into the pandemic, and right now it is performing as expected. We are especially focused on monitoring and engaging with our clients in our hotel franchise finance and technology and innovation segments, which will be reviewed in more detail later in the call. During the quarter, we repurchased 1.8 million shares at an average price of $35.30. Additionally, consistent with our 10B5 plan, we repurchased 270,000 shares thus far in Q2. However, however, given the rapidly changing environment, we have now paused our share repurchase activity. Finally, Western Alliance arrives at this crisis in a position of strength, uniquely prepared to address what's ahead. We remain well capitalized and highly liquid with a CET1 ratio of 9.7% and ample liquidity, total liquidity resources of over $10 billion. Dale will now take you through our financial performance. For the first quarter, Western Alliance generated net income of $84 million or $0.83 cents earnings per share. Net income was reduced by a $51.2 million provision for credit losses driven by the adoption of CECL, balance sheet growth, as well as the change in the economic outlook due to the pandemic. Strong ongoing balance sheet momentum coupled with diligent expense management drove operating pre-provision net revenue to $163.4 million, up 10% from a year ago, which we believe is the most relevant metric to evaluate the ongoing earnings power of the company. Net interest income and fee income remain relatively stable, producing net operating revenue of $285.3 million, primarily a result of lower yields on loans, which was partially offset by lower rates on deposits and borrowings. Non-interest income declined $10.9 million to five point one from the prior quarter due to mark-to-market of preferred stock holdings of primarily large money center banks of $11.3 million, partially offset by $3.8 million equity investment gain. To date, of the $11.3 million mark, three and a half has been recovered. As credit spreads widened during the last quarter, the yield on preferred stocks followed, impacting valuations. We do not believe this represents a permanently reduced valuation and, and, and that preferred stock values will continue to recover over time. Finally, non-interest expense declined $9.3 million as compensation and other operating expenses declined by 7 Regarding implementing CECL in our allowance for credit losses, in our 10K, we disclosed the adoption impact of $37 million, $19 million of which was attributable to funded loans, $15 million for unfunded commitments, and $2.6 million for held to maturity securities. This resulted in a combined January 1st allowance of $214 million. During Q1, loan growth drove an additional $24 million of required reserves and another $30 million was driven by changes in the economic outlook as a result of the pandemic. In total, reserve bill during the first quarter was $91 million, an increase of 50% from the year-end from the year-end reserve. The quarter-end ACL of $268 million was 1.14% of funded loans, up 30 basis points. Provision expense for the quarter was $51.2 million, which is over 10 times the average quarterly provision during 2019. As of March 31st, the reserve bill reflects the, our best estimate of the future economic environment, including the impact of government stimulus programs. We utilized an assimilation of various Moody's macroeconomic outlook scenarios to capture the most likely economic outcomes and a more severe scenario for potential tail risks. As the economy continues to change, we will adjust our ACL modeling accordingly. Turning now to net interest drivers, net interest income for the quarter declined a modest $3 million from the prior quarter to $269 million, as there was one last day during the quarter compared to Q4, and margin compression was offset by loan and deposit growth. Investment yields showed a modest improvement of two basis points from the prior quarter to 2.98%. However, on a linked quarter basis, loan yields increased 31 basis points due to the lower rate environment. The average yield of our portfolio at quarter end, or the spot rate, 
was 5.02%. Interest-bearing deposit costs increased 18 basis points in Q1 to 90 basis points as a result of immediate steps taken to reduce our deposit costs after the FOMC cut rates twice in March. The spot rate of total deposits at quarter end was 29 basis points. Total funding costs decreased 11 when all of the company's funding sources are considered, including non-interest-bearing and borrowings. Through the transition to a substantially lower rate environment during the quarter, net interest income was $269 million, a decline of 1.1% from Q4. Continued strong balance sheet growth and immediate steps taken to reduce the cost of interest-bearing deposits counteracted the decline in prime and LIBOR. Net interest margin declined 17 basis points to 4.22% during the quarter as our earning asset yield fell 28, partially offset by 19 basis point funding cost decrease. With regards to our asset sensitivity, our rate risk profile has declined notably as the majority of our variable rate loan portfolio has flipped to fixed rate as floors have been triggered in the declining rate environment. Presently, 82% or $8.1 billion of variable rate loans with floors are at the floors. With the addition of our mix to shift primarily to fixed rate residential loans, $16.2 million or 70% of loans are now behaving as a fixed rate portfolio. This has reduced our interest rate risk in a 100 basis point parallel shock lower scenario to 3% at March 31st from 6.5% one year ago and assumes that rates are held flat at zero across the term structure. Turning now to operating efficiency, on a linked quarter basis, our efficiency ratio decreased 200 basis points to 41.8%. As mentioned earlier, the improvement was attributed to decreases in compensation and other operating expenses, while our revenues increased modestly. As a core component of our strategy, we continue disciplined expense management to sustain industry-leading operating leverage and profitability. Our core underlying earnings power remains strong as pre-provision net revenue ROA was 2.38% flat from the prior quarter, while return on assets was down 70 basis points to 1.22%, directly related to our provision expense and excessive charge-offs of $54.4 million. As Ken mentioned earlier, our strong balance sheet momentum from 2019 continued into Q1. During the quarter, loans increased $2 billion to $23.2 billion, and deposits also grew $2 billion to $24.8. The loan-to-deposit ratio increased to 93.2 from 92.7 in the fourth quarter. Our strong liquidity position continues to provide us with balance sheet capacity to meet funding needs. Shareholders' equity declined by $17 million as dividends and share repurchases were matched by net income. Tangible book value per share increased $0.19 cents over the prior quarter to $26.73 per share as our share count declined. We continue to believe our ability to profitably grow deposits is both a key differentiator and a core value driver to our platform's long-term value creation. Q1 is a seasonally strong deposit quarter, and coupled with the rollout of our deposit initiatives, deposits grew $2 billion. The increase was driven by growth of $1.3 billion in non-interest-bearing DDA, primarily from market share gains in our mortgage warehouse operations. Additionally, HOA continues to perform well and contributed $330 million of low-cost deposits. During the quarter, the relative proportion of non-interest-bearing DDA grew to nearly 40% of deposits from 37.5% on a linked quarter basis. Turning to loan growth, in line with the industry, the vast majority of growth was driven by increases in CNI loans totaling $1.8 billion, followed by $107 million in construction and land development and $92 million in residential. Residential loans now comprise 9.7% of our portfolio, while construction loans decreased as a relative proportion of the portfolio to 8.9% from 9.2 in the fourth. At the segment level, tech and innovation loans grew $626 million, with $124 from capital call and subscription lines and $176 million from existing technology loan draws, in turn bolstering technology-related deposits by $383 million. Corporate finance loans grew $408 million, which was primarily due to line draws, 
two-thirds of which were from investment-grade borrowers, bringing utilization rates to 38% from 13% during the prior quarter. Mortgage Warehouse also contributed loan growth of $550 million, approximately 50% of which was due to line draws. Across the bank, one quarter, or about $500 million, of our net new loan growth was driven by drawdowns on existing loan commitments from the beginning of the quarter. In all, total loan growth of $2.2 million for the quarter was fully funded by deposit growth of the same amount. Overall, asset quality was stable during the quarter with total diversely graded assets increasing $10 million during the quarter to $351 million, while non-performing assets comprised of loans on non-accrual and repossessed real estate increased $27 million to 97, $27 million to 97, or 0.33% of total assets, and is now is held for sale. Within these categories, we had migration from special mention to substandard, as some of the normal investor funding was delayed in tech and innovation. As a precaution, when remaining liquidity declines below six months, we bring those loans into either special mention or sub for enhanced monitoring and engagement. This quarter, we, also, we saw the cumulative impact of our efforts in managing certain special mention and substandard loans, as several were resolved in our favor with no losses. 100 million of adversely graded loans were resolved during the past quarter. 37 loans, or 50 million, paid off in full, while, while the other 50 million were upgraded to pass. As Ken mentioned in his introduction, we are well positioned entering this economic cycle. We only incurred $100,000 of gross, gross credit losses during the quarter, which was more than offset by $3.3 million in recoveries, resulting in net recoveries of $3.2 million. We typically have one or two one-off credit charges every quarter. However, highlighting the strength of our loan book, we didn't experience any of these in Q1. We believe early indication, in identification and conservative management helps mitigate losses on these assets. In all, the ACL to funded loans increased 30 basis points to 1.14% in Q1 as a result of CECL adoption and the resultant provision expense related to Q1 loan growth and changes in the economic outlook. We continue to generate capital and maintain strong regulatory capital ratios with tangible common equity to total assets of 9.4% and a CET1 ratio of 97 in Q1, our reduction of TCE to total assets was mainly driven by $2.3 billion increase in tangible assets due to our significant loan growth, while the tangible common equity was affected by the $54 million of provisions and excessive charge-offs due to CECL adoption. In spite of reduced quarterly earnings and the payment of quarterly cash dividends of $0.25 cents per share, our tangible book value per share rose $0.19 cents in the quarter to $26.73 and is up 15.2% in the past year. Our diversified deposit generation platform and access to significant liquidity resources is critical in times of economic stress. Overall, we have access to over $10 billion in liquidity, primarily through our $4.7 billion investment portfolio, of which $2.7 billion are investment grade, readily marketable, and not pledged on any borrowing base. Additionally, we have $7 billion in unused borrowing capacity with the Fed, Federal Home Loan Bank, and correspondence. Our strong capital base, access to liquidity, and diversified business model will allow us to address any credit demands in the future. I'll now hand back the call to Ken to conclude with comments on a few of our specific portfolios. Thanks, Dale. Uh, regarding our hotel franchise finance business, we believe our focus on the select service subsegment conservative loan-to-cost underwriting discipline, and strong operating partners sets us up for a maximum financial flexibility to weather the duration of the crisis. Like most hotels in the country, our clients have seen a dramatic reduction in occupancy rates over the last month, and senior management is involved in active dialogue with each borrower to evaluate remediation efforts and contingency plans. Going into the pandemic, 75% of the portfolio had an LTV under 65%, and more than 73% had a debt service coverage ratio of 1.3 times. Additionally, we only partner with experienced hotel operators with significant invested equity and resources to support ongoing operations. 
fully 66% of the portfolio is with large sponsors who operate more than 25 hotels, and 90% operate 10 or more properties with top franchise or flags. Based on our ongoing constructive dialogue, we believe that sponsors view this as a temporary event and want to continue to maintain and support these properties over the long term given their significant equity investments. We are actively working with them to appropriately utilize the Triple P program and the Main Street Lending programs along with their own liquidity as a helpful financial bridge to arrive at a longer-term solution. Based on the mutually developed financial action plans, we will selectively implement loan modifications along the lines we previously discussed. This is a prime example where both parties contribute to a comprehensive solution. Now, regarding our tech and innovation business, we primarily finance established growth technology firms with a strong risk profile, mainly companies classified as stage two with an established business model, validated product, multiple rounds of investment, and a path to profitability. This provides greater operating and financial flexibility in times of stress. 99% of the borrowers have revenues greater than $5 million and have strong institutional backing with 86% backed by one or more VC or PE firms. During the quarter, the portfolio grew $495 million to $2 billion or 8.8% of the total portfolio, which was attributed to $175 million of existing line drawdowns in the technology division and an additional $124 million from capital call lines a product that historically has had zero losses. Tech and innovation commitments grew $284 million in Q1, and utilization rates increased to 60% from 49% in Q4 2019. The portfolio is fairly granular with average loan size of $6 million, and these borrowers are generally liquid with more than 2 to 1 deposit coverage ratio. Additionally, since 2007, warrant income has covered cumulative net charge-offs two times over. Currently, 14% of technology loans, or $164 million, has less than six months remaining liquidity, which is in line with historical trends. Although some fundraising has been delayed, we were pleased to see several investment rounds close over the last several weeks and days with strong continued sponsored support. In conclusion, we see increased cash generation driven by our balance sheet momentum going into the quarter end, as well as continued loan growth from the triple P distributions. We expect pre-provision net revenue to continue to grow through Q2 with the ability to absorb any necessary future provisions. Given uncertainty surrounding the likely duration of the virus and evolving economic environment, we will continue to reassess our outlook as health and economic facts warrant. Regarding asset quality, our proactive risk management approach is institutionalized throughout the company. We are actively working with our borrowers to develop mutually agreed upon financial plans, assuming an elongated economic downturn that leads to long-term solutions. Our strong collateral positions and little unsecured or consumer lending should serve us well in mitigating potential risk of loss as we navigate these uncertain times. We stand ready to implement the likely next phase of Triple P and the Main Street Lending Program to assist our clients and communities. Finally, Western Alliance has assembled a seasoned management team that has weathered several economic downturns and is applying the lessons learned from the Great Recession to face these uncertain economic times. And with that, we'll open up the line operator and we'll take everyone's questions. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star, then one, on your touchtone phone. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star, then two. The first question today comes from Casey Hare of Jeffries. Please go ahead. Thanks. Good morning, guys. Um, this question on the on the reserve build. Um, Obviously, you know, a, a, a tricky, um, tricky uh, proposition here. But trying to get it, uh, you guys mentioned you used a bunch of Moody scenarios. Can you just give us some color as to, um, you know, how much weighting uh, was given to, to the Moody's adverse scenario? You know, what kind of recovery you guys are, are assuming? Um, how much government help 
Um, you know, the stimulus stuff that the, the government is doing is, you know, offset it, and then obviously, you know, the duration. I, I know that's a lot, but just trying to get some color as to as to the uh, the magnitude of, of reserve build here. Yeah, so, so are, are we primarily use the baseline case as of March 31st, uh, and um, and then we looked at uh, we looked at S1 and we looked at S3. S3 is the kind of the adverse scenario, uh, which uh, is a, uh, obviously more more critical in a, a longer recovery period. Um, we we do struggle with what you know what what is the timeline of this uh, of this um, type of thing and how much do the things come back. We do think that the the institutions and the plans done by the federal government and both on the on the congressional side as well as as well as the uh, FOMC have an effect in terms of being able to you know mitigate this and draw make a bridge to to when we're at a time when we can start to turn the economy back on. I don't have a timeline for you in terms of kind of when that is going to be, but we will look at this. We uh, we fully reserved as of March 31st, and um, and we'll look at this again at the end of the second quarter. Yeah, I would just add and say, you know, we did factor in some impact of the Triple P program, but as we were processing, we didn't know what that size level was going to be. Uh, so, you know, having 2,600 uh, participants over a billion five looking to go out is going to be very helpful. I don't think it's been fully factored into our reserve calculations, but that billion five will help cover $6.7 billion of commitments in our company or $4.6 billion of current outstanding loans, which means that's about 20% of our current portfolio. Okay, great. Um, and just, just following up on the on the loan modifications, if I heard you right, I think you said $400 million uh, to date. Um, so it's just specifically what, what exactly um, are you guys – uh, you guys doing there, and then you know, uh, like any color as to how how much you've improved upon that 400 million uh, at, as of April 17th here. Yeah. Um, by the way, that 400 million is April 17th number. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, number two, um, I would say in terms of color, I think we caught a lot of our clients by surprise, our borrowers by surprise, when we said early on, this is going to be a longer-term problem, and let's have a longer-term solution rather than the standardized cookie-cutter 90-day P&I deferral. And by the way, that took a lot of getting used to from our client base, and we had to go back to them several times. As we've had that conversation, you can see that our viewpoint is more likely than not uh, going to be correct. We don't know how long it's going to go, but we said, let's start with figuring it out and through the end of the year. And because of that, we need you, the borrower, to contribute something, more equity, more collateral, more, more, more liquidity to the project, and then we will help you along with a deferral as well. And we took each loan on a case-by-case -case basis, and we didn't make broad proclamations that said, we'll just do 90 days here. So every loan is, is being different. And I assume as we get into questions about different books of business, I'll give you some stories behind each one of those books of business. But we think getting out there and dealing with our clients on a one-to-one -one basis is going to be helpful. And by the way, the same lessons that we learned in the Great, down, in the great Recession, that getting there early, having conversations for the longer term, helps our clients survive, but more importantly, they know that we'll be there when they start to see growth opportunities, and the combination of their growth opportunities, the ability to get through this, gives them the ability to prosper longer term, and that's our approach when we sit down and we talk to our clients' case. Okay, great. Um, just last one from me. Um, you guys are clearly prioritizing uh, the Triple P program for loan growth. Just a question: you know, How what are you how are you guys funding this? Um, just trying to get a sense for what the margin, the incremental NIM might be, and um, you know how, how willing, uh, you know how you know regarding capital and liquidity, you know are you willing to to go much higher on the lo loan to deposit ratio and 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 as well as on the TCE ratio. So you, you may have noticed uh, our ending balances for loans and deposits were significantly above the average balance for the first quarter. So we had 1.7 billion more in loans and a billion five more in deposits. Two thirds of the deposit number was in DDA. That gives us, I think, momentum in terms of expanding PP&R into 2Q. 
You layer this billion and a half then on top of that. We have a myriad of ways to be able to fund this. One is we think we have you know, additional deposit opportunities. Two is the Federal Reserve has said they'll advance 100% on these loans. And three, we have another $10 billion of liquidity that we could get elsewhere. So we're not really concerned about, you know, about funding that um, cost. I think it's going to be something around 25 basis points. If we put it to the Fed, it's 35 basis points to do that. And, we're, and we'll, we'll, then we'll take these in. Um, so that, again, I, I think shows, you know, that we expect, you know, continued balance sheet growth into the second quarter, primarily driven by these triple P notes. Okay, so and, and if I'm if I'm understanding the triple P, it it, it comes on at a, at around two percent with the with the fees associated. So it, it looks like a, about a one seventy five incremental margin. Yeah, so our, right? our 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 weighted fee on on the billion five we've done is two point four percent, and and then these loans. I mean, the preponderance of this is fairly short term. We're going to call it six months. But then for the, for the part that isn't forgivable, that has a tail that, that goes out two years. Gotcha. And on the, the actual loan rate on the entire program is 1%. So you get 2.4% on the entire bucket, and some of that is going to be accelerated in terms of recognition based upon the short-term nature of the, of the, um, of the forgivable element. Great. Thank you. I'll step back. The next question today comes from Aaron Saganovich of City. Please go ahead. Thanks. I, I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about um, the, the working with the customers. I appreciate all the commentary. I guess I, I just want to have a better understanding of you know, what proportion of your customers are actually getting deferrals now and, um, and how, that, how those are categorized relative to the modifications that you're discussing. I'm going to let Tim Bruckner, uh, our chief credit officer, take that on. Hi, right, thank you. And this this is, I think, a nice follow-on to the discussion we've we've just had. In in the prioritization uh, of this, the customer uh, conversation, that dialogue, is of top priority. So that started for us back in February. We've got two parts to this that uh, have come into our common language. There's the the trough, and then there's uh, there's the recovery and stabilization and a new normal. As as a bank and as a business, we know that the better that we do and the better that we help uh, our borrowers through that trough in terms of uh, proper planning, uh, the better that asset stabilizes in in the new normal. So, the the, the conversations are actually uh, going very. Uh, very well, but but there there's obvious differences uh, between borrowers and industries and businesses, uh, and and so necessarily there's different uh, conversations and discussions. But what that lets us do as a business is then monitor that cash and liquidity through the trough, and be best positioned in in the recovery and in stabilization and in normal whatever it is for their business. And so it's really a dialogue that started in, in February, and it will continue uh, throughout this entire process. Uh, PPP is just part of it. So uh, this is Ken. Let me just – it's an interesting question that you asked because there's not one uh, singular answer for the entire portfolio. It depends which portfolio you're talking about. But maybe some color behind the portfolios would be helpful here. So, for example, we're, we're talking uh, to everyone in the uh, hotel book, right? That's HFF. That's $2 billion. Well, 50% of those, 50% of our clients have already made their P&I for April. And then 80% of the remaining 50% are in deep, deep conversations with us where we hope that we'll have something tied down in the next couple of weeks in terms of a modification program. And then they'll make their payments at that time or maybe they'll extend first and then we'll get some payments after that. So that's the, that's the hotel book, and that's how the conversation's going there. The conversation, say, in lot banking is quite different. We're actually getting inbound calls, and, we're, we're, and people are asking us, are you going to be there when we find opportunities? And then our question is, well, are you looking for deferments? And we've had a couple uh, deferrals. We've had a couple clients call in and say, I'm not going to ask for anything. I'm looking at the future. I need you to stand with us. So those are just two different 
two different ways the book is different. Um, our gaming book, okay, is completely different than what's happening. We think our gaming book, other than five or six small de uh, deferrals that we made on prin uh, principle, we think our overall gaming book has enough liquidity to survive into the summer. All right, which is so that makes our conversation there a little bit different. We can take a little bit more time. We can see how the Main Street lending facility can be accessed because game, the gaming companies could not access the Triple P program. So every different the, uh, segment of our book has a different conversation. And that's why, if, if I can reiterate again, and Tim was very early on this in our, uh, or in a, we do a weekly senior operating committee meeting, but in the second or third week of January, he just stood up and said, okay, we're going to have senior leaders be in charge of books of business across the entire company that have workout experience, heavy credit experience, have been through something like this, and therefore we can tell each discussion differently. That's for, so for example, Robert running the hotel business, you know, Robert was born with hotel business in his veins. Why wouldn't he take that on and run with that? All right. And so we look for different strengths to match up against the portfolio here. I'm sorry it was a longer answer, but I, I hope it gave you some color as to uh, how we're managing our conversations with our clients. No, that's, that's very helpful. I appreciate it. Thank you. The next question today comes from Brock Vanderley of UBS. Please go ahead. Oh, thanks. Good morning. Um, just, uh, you know, bigger, big picture to start. Do you think this is going to be a, um, you know, mild or severe um, recession in the scale of recessions that you've that we've experienced in the past? Well, my my answer keeps evolving as information evolves, um, and I try not to be tick by tick. Uh, but certainly, um, more pessimistic than I was in early March and mid March. Um, you know, given uh, 22 and a half million people have recently filed for unemployment claims. So I think it's going to be deeper than I've ever experienced. All right. Uh, but I think our, our answers or our approach was one that we anticipated that it was going to be longer than what people thought. We just didn't think the severity of what we're seeing was going to be as deep. Okay, and and more specifically around you know, investors' real concerns here for for the hotel book, like what what percentage of properties would you say you know, go bankrupt in an average recession? What, okay, what so I'm sorry, Brock. I, I I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so we went back and we looked at the GE. Uh, this was originally the GE business and we bought it uh, in G, from GE 2016. So we went back and we looked at their performance level from 2007 to 2015. And during that time, during those eight years, total losses amounted to $52 million. Average charge-offs of 60 basis points, with peak losses coming in 2010 at 3.3%. They had a portfolio of about a billion dollars in size. Now, what's important to note is their portfolio was completely different than the model that we constructed. Their portfolio was more of a shotgun approach. They had weak flags. We do not. They have small operators. We do not. They had weak sponsors. We do not. And they had LTVs of 75%, and our LTVs, as I said earlier, are about 60%. So we have a different model than what they have. But that's our best look back to get a gauge of what may happen going forward, adjusting for the difference, part of, difference of, of our model. Tim, you want I, to I, I just want to add one thing to that is um, I think our, if you really look at it too, our sponsorship and sophistication uh, of investor composition is, is a lot different than, uh, than that legacy portfolio as well. We, we really have um, the larger operators, uh, the, the higher level of sophisticated in, investor. When we have these dialogues 
and say, come on, we're solving for something here that isn't 90 days. Uh, we have folks that understand why and how we can work together and do that. And, that, and that's going to keep the leverage down on this portfolio. How we do on that uh, puts us in the position and the rebound that we want to be in. And lastly, the um, the debt service coverage ratios that you show on page 20, are those as of Q1 or are those through April? Because clearly you know, hotel performance has gotten deteriorated. Yeah, no, they're, they're through Q1, uh, Brock. We wouldn't have that information that quickly for April. Got it. Okay. All right. Thanks for the color. Okay. Thank you. The next question today comes from Brad Milsop of Piper Sandler. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning, Brad. Um, Ken, um, I think you gave the stat on the uh, tech book that 14% of the companies had uh, cash on hand uh, six months or less, which was pretty consistent with history. I was curious if um, if you could give that same kind of stat for the hotel book Obviously, I know that the PPP program, you know, is having an impact there as well. But just kind of wanted to get any kind of sense on, you know, kind of the forward look on on debt service coverage for for that book. If you could look at it in, in a similar way to uh, as you as you looked at the tech book. Well, I don't have the stat on what the collective liquidity is for um, the the hotel book. Uh, we are that that is one of the single most important questions we ask. Our clients, and it's we're, we're gathering that information uh, as we speak. Uh, they generally don't run with a lot of liquidity. And now here's my however. My however is if you are a recently opened hotel, which we have a couple, they have liquidity because they have that they had that liquidity on um, on their balance sheet getting ready for the opening. So they're they're okay. If you're a hotel that was building up your reserve to do a pip. You have some of that liquidity. Uh, if you're a hotel that's been operating for a while and distributions have gone back to your investors, you have less, and therefore we have to talk to you to go to the investors to get a capital call to come in for you to get a defer uh, to get some deferral. So a little bit different, and that's why one of the things that if I can keep repeating here, case by case, individual hotel by individual hotel. And uh, or individual property throughout the whole book of business. Okay, and uh, just maybe a follow up, uh, two follow ups. One, um, how large is the uh, is the gaming book? And then secondly, I think at the end of last year you had about eight and a half billion of unfunded commitments um, in total for the whole loan portfolio. Uh, can you talk about the potential, you know, for those to be drawn down? Maybe where you've cut those two and, and, and the implications of that with that would have on capital. So I'll take the easy question, and then I'll flip it over to Dale for the harder one. The simple answer is $500 million on gaming. Yeah, so so our, the most significant draw we've ever had on on unfunded has been 8% of, of that amount, which, frankly, we got close to uh, kind of, you know, where, where we were, um, in, you know, with this uh, drawdown. We're not seeing any more additional draws um, at this time. We're... In fact, we've had some kind of re repayments of some of those draws. So, so we don't see, and, and a lot of these draws, are, I mean, there or these commitment lines, I, we don't think they would really kind of ever be drawn down in terms of um, you know the structure behind some of these some of these credits. So, so while we have you know these unfunded elements to them, and you know we we did have a drawdown in in March predominantly, um, we're not seeing anything else subsequent to that. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. I'll hop back in queue. Our next question today comes from Chris Negrati of KBW. Please go ahead. Hey, Chris. Great. Hey, Dale. Um, quick question on just the balance sheet tra uh, trajectory. Um, given the comments about the growth and the draws, um, uh, any thoughts on, on adjusting the resi mortgage strategy a bit to just to, in light of the capital and liquidity? So um, the, resi, the, the, the purchase of resi mortgages uh, may be far more opportunistic right now than we've ever seen, as uh, some of our clients are selling their mortgages at, at significant discounts. 
which uh, will allow us to go ahead and, uh, and buy at higher yields than we bought in Q1. So we're going to look at that. You know, the keyword we used to use or we used for our share repurchase was opportunistic. Same thing here. If we can get the right risk-reward trade-off, in fact, there are already mortgages available that have better or lower LTVs, uh, lower uh, DTI, um, and higher FICO scores that are selling for much higher yields than uh, we've recently purchased, say, at the end of uh, 2019. So we'll look at that, and if there's opportunity there, we're going to take take advantage of it. I think an important thing on this program, as well as on the hotel book, is is you know collateral. I mean, we are in strong collateral positions, that uh, such that it would take you know considerable sustained valuation declines to ever pierce where we are in terms of risk of loss. And just, just if I could follow up, Dale, in terms of the, either the CET1 or, or the tangible, obviously this quarter had a big, big jump down just because of the growth. Where do you, where do you comfortably run those ratios in this environment over the next few quarters? Well, I mean, so we saw a decline in, in those two. Now, with the Triple P program, that could pull down our, our TCE. It really won't have an effect on CET1 because those are all, you know, 0% risk weight as their SBA backed. But we can see this number come down into the eights. Okay. Uh, and then maybe the last one, if I could do it. The, um, the color on the hotel history of loss is great. Could you, could you do a similar run through of the tech book in terms of, you know, peak losses when, when you didn't own it? Um, I think they were kind of in the mid single digit, but the early stage, but just blended. I think they were around 2-3%. Any color would be great. Uh, your, your, your recollection is correct. I don't have those in front of me, but we'll we'll pull them up as you know they're available on a SNL. Yeah, the last time I looked at it, and it was a while ago, and it wasn't for this particular situation. Uh, as I said in my uh, prepared remarks, there was a two times coverage of the warrant income to the credit losses, and as you know, credit losses come early, and the warrant income comes later. Uh, but when you look at it overall, that w- the warrant income that we get has always covered. Uh, the the equi- more than covered uh, the credit losses. Unfortunately, we can, it just can't be timed to be in the same quarter. I think it's also notable that that our mix has changed uh, uh, since then as well. So you know we're now doing a significant portion of our growth has been in these capital call and subscription lines. It's not something that Bridge was uh, engaged in as a standalone enterprise, but something that we entered in, as part of our you know risk mitigation strategy essentially last year. To, uh, to really lend into areas that have had zero to no losses historically for not just us, but for other participants in the space. Now, you know, um, let me give you some color as uh, part of uh, our review. Just so you know, um, I'll speak for Tim Bruckner here for a second, but, you know, every Monday at my SO Senior Operating Committee meeting, we set the tone for what we're going to try to accomplish that week, that that month, that quarter, and so forth, depending on the circumstances. And then we, we run two senior loan committees on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Basically, we're not really approving senior loan packages, but we are reviewing large uh, uh, credits that are being worked on for modification. And then Tim holds individual weekly meetings with each one of our risk segments. So we're, we're daily talking to a segment and getting live information. So on the tech and innovation, which is as live as I can get it, you know, I was I was asking the credit officer there last night, how would you describe our book of business? And the way he just said what what he said was, I see rating turbulence, but I don't see large losses. So things can move around in terms of pass, not pass, but um, he's he's at this point, the book is behaving well. At this point, I, I, I might add just one one more point to that. Um, we we've seen the support from the sponsorship. Um, what we're, we're in these transactions at a low loan to value with with a number of rounds typically in front of us before we're in. Um, and so what we're seeing is if if uh, anything takes a um, a hit here. It's a hit on valuation uh, before it, it, it impacts our loan. So the, the rounds are clearing, uh, the funding is occurring, uh, the valuations might be slightly lower, uh, but the, the capital is still flowing in this segment, and uh, and that 
uh, gives me some comfort. Great. Thanks for all the color. The next question comes from Tamira Braziller of Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, maybe for Dale first, uh, you had indicated that you're starting to see some of the utilization come back. Um, is that in the technology book as well, or are those utilization rates still uh, increasing? Uh, I, I'm, all those, our utilization rates are fairly stable uh, for where we are right now um, on both sides, both on the tech and innovation as well as in the corporate finance area. Okay, and then of the 14% of the, the tech uh, loans, which have six months or less of liquidity, have any of those been funded up in the last couple of weeks, or was your commentary in the prepared remarks uh, for, for other relationships? Um, no, what's there now has not been funded up. We had a, we had a couple of uh, uh, sponsors put money into a couple projects uh, right before the end of the quarter, which was helpful to us. But, you know, uh, overall, um, that number has been relatively steady in Bridges' history. Uh, but we, we are encouraged by what we're seeing away from us with sponsors completing their rounds. We actually had uh, credit that uh, wasn't in any trouble in our life science yesterday uh, that got a substantial amount of sponsor financing. So we're not seeing it. We're not seeing the sponsor financing run away from us or run away from the the industry. Okay, and then just one more on the loan uh, modification. It, it looks like at least through quarter end, the majority of it was within your Arizona and Nevada portfolios. I guess what's driving that is that forbearance on on residential loans or why such a high number out of those two geographies. It's it's really the pace and cadence of those customer discussions. Those discussions drive it. Um, the discussion results in an assessment of liquidity, uh, liquidity necessary to, to bridge the trough. Uh, in some cases, that liquidity already exists. The, the solution, which may include uh, some form of modification, is tailored, uh, tailored to the liquidity golf. So it's really just the the pace and cadence of those uh, discussions. Okay, and then last question for me, uh, for you, Ken, with your commentary that you're a little more pessimistic now than you were in, in mid to late March, I'm just wondering how that correlates with using the, the baseline Moody's assumption for uh, allowance. Can we see another tick higher for adjustment on the existing portfolio, or at this time, are you still comfortable with the $30 million that was provided for the existing book in detail? So I'm comfortable with, with the provision that we provide at quarter end based on everything we knew at that time, right? Um, I'm sorry, I just, I, I, just had, I, I just had a senior moment. Second part of your question was, do you, do you well, see yes, any please. more to it? Yeah. Do yeah. you want to take that? Or? Well, so obviously this seems to change almost by the hour. Right. Um, in terms of what the expectations are, and and since then we've had we've had some worse news. We've had you know north of 20 million people file for unemployment. We maybe got teased with some good news with you know last night with uh, with a, a, a treatment that looks like it's going to be um, you know proved to be efficacious for this. You know in the next 75 days, my guess is there's going to be a lot more news. And so we're going to reassess this at the end at the end of June in terms of what that looks like. You know, if we can get things back, you know, in some track upward again in terms of the economic outlook, I could see things getting better. If that's not the case, you know, if we're still doing, you know, kind of in this lockdown phase, I I don't think that's you know we're probably looking at additional provision in the second quarter. Can't really say right now. Yeah, I just I'm uh, sorry, recaptured my thought. I I froze there for a moment thinking. But I think what's going to be surprising to folks is that the pace of charge-offs are going to be, uh, or the cycle is going to be pushed out and elongated because of the triple fee program and because of the Main Street lending facility. And I think people, I think investors will be surprised uh, that there aren't char heavy charge-offs coming early on. Maybe on some of the smaller businesses, you would expect to see them. But on some of the larger credits, I don't see charge-offs coming to the back part of the year if they come at that time, right? 
And so now, added to Dale's comment, depending on how quickly the, the country opens up and the speed and the pace, will then determine what we need to do as we look forward at the end of Q2. Right. Good commentary. Thank you. The next question today comes from John Arfstrom of RBC Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Hey, uh, thanks. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, uh, thanks for that comment, Ken. I was ju I was just I was just going to ask about that, but maybe um, we'll go at it a different way in the provision. Um, so, Dale, the I think what you're saying is things are a little better by late June, early July. That 30 million incremental in the provision would go away for Q2. Is that the right way to think about it? Well, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that that $30 million would be reversed. I mean, if, if the outlook at the, end of, at the end of June is similar to what it was at the end of the first quarter, I think that there's no additional amount given for deterioration of, of, uh, of, you know, of credit conditions. So I think that holds that holds with that thirty million. You know, for for that to be released back into income, I think we probably have to get to a farther period down the road and say, you know what, we actually are well on our way toward you know reducing our unemployment rate. We're bringing people back in, and so the outlook is better than kind of what is the base case for Moody's at the end of the first quarter. And and when we're and we're have which you know that has an extended re, you know return. I mean that's that's. That, some of that really is held down through the end through 2021. If instead you get back to something that resembles more of you know pick your letter right you know a V or a U instead of like a you know a lazy U or an L you know I, I think there's a possibility that you could release that. I think what Ken said was we're not really ex expecting to experience charge offs if and when they come until after these periods of the PPP program, the Main Street Lending program. And as well as you know the 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 rules the rules allowing you know for certain types of some of these um, some of these uh, restructurings that can be done in the in the sight of this of this overall pandemic that's going to push out recognition of loss at least I think a couple of quarters. Yep, yep that all makes sense. And I, I'm not saying reversal. I'm just saying it doesn't it doesn't show up again in Q2. Uh, I, I guess the other question um, is on margin. Um, it appears like you're set up reasonably well from a margin perspective. I appreciate all the disclosure, but give us an idea of some of the you know, near-term, longer-term puts and takes. How are you thinking about the margin? Yeah, so um, you know we, we have a, you know a lot of clients that are at their floors. We talked about that. Um, you know, I would say competitively at this point in time, you know, spreads have widened out as as rates uh, as rates came down as uncertainty rose. Uh, if that settles in, you could see that maybe some of the spreads would actually come down over time, which could put pressure on earning asset yields on a more longer-term basis. I think that assumes that things are getting better economically. Well, if things are getting better economically, maybe the Fed is then inclined to look at, you know, where we are in the zero band and start putting that back up. So, you know, you could be in a scenario that you actually don't see, you know, rates coming down in terms of loans generally because, at the same time, spreads are declining. Maybe overall base rates start to rise because people are comfortable in terms of kind of the recovery of the economy. So, but those are two dynamics that I really don't know how to gauge. But we are, you know, we're at the zero bound here. I, you know, I don't see you know, obviously think, we, I don't think things are going to get lower. The, the you know the Fed has come out and said that they're against negative rates. I think that would certainly be a mistake to go there. So, I mean, you you maybe have this kind of overall lighter compression over time. But you know, as of right now, that's certainly not the case. As Ken indicated on the residential side in particular, you know, we actually seen, have seen rates rise. And, and in fact, you know, spreads in, in residential loans have increased in some cases and, and really haven't participated in, in terms of the rate cuts that have taken place. Okay, good. Um, and then, and Ken, Ken, maybe one more for you. Um, talked earlier about a, a billion five in organic loan growth and maybe a third of it was uh, – Credit drawdowns is, I think, what you said. Um, you talk a little bit about the quality of that growth. How, how you think about that is, is um, you know, it seems like still a big number for a lot of uncertainty in the economy. So maybe just bigger picture, broader. Talk about uh, the quality of the growth and maybe some of the drivers of that. 
Yeah, so uh, the loan growth was $2 billion. The uh, credit drawdowns uh, brought it down to what would have been $1.5 billion. Uh, that was our estimate uh, uh, somewhere early into the quarter when we started to see some opportunities build. Now, uh, where that growth came from, capital call lines, industry has never had a loss, came from warehouse lending. Uh, we've had that business 11 plus years. We've never had a loss. It came in resort financing. Uh, not only have we never had a loss, but the team that's been running that business for 35 years has never had a loss. So you go if, if you can forget about the pandemic for a second and go back to our approach in 2019, we started talking about de-risking the balance sheet. CLD was coming down, which it has, and we were uptake. We're, uh, you saw the uptake in our residential book of business and our warehouse lending and our capital call lines uh, and resort financing. So um, those businesses are zero or very low risk loss businesses. And, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't expect the volume for Q2 to match what we did in Q1 on an organic basis, but I would expect the growth to come in those business segments that I just mentioned. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. The next question today comes from Tyler Stafford of Stevens. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, guys. Uh, maybe just to, to start uh, on that last question there, uh, or last comment, um, can you just talk about the, the balance sheet growth expectations this year? Obviously, a strong start here in the first quarter. Uh, you mentioned some of the, the drawdowns on the lines, but just how, how should we think about uh, both both loan and deposit growth uh, for the remainder of the year relative to that prior kind of six to eight hundred million dollar range? Thanks. Um, I'm not going to put a, a number out there. Uh, there are just so many moving factors. Um, I, I have a little more visibility uh, around Q2. Um, and, you know, I think I would plan, absent the triple P loan portfolio, I think I would plan on the lower end of that range, five to six hundred million on deposits, five to six hundred million on, on loans. And if we surprise to the upside, then great. We, we put in on the deposit side a number of different programs um, that we thought, we hoped that could be successful uh, and or maybe uh, take some market share uh, from our peer group. Um, we'll see if we can make that happen for the rest of the year. Uh, but I, I think towards the lower end of that range would be the right thing to do. And don't forget, if, when we spike in Q2 and have some of that spike hold on to Q3 because of the triple P loans, uh, they're going to just fall away uh, towards the back half of the year. Uh, fair enough. I fully recognize there's lots of puts and takes there. Thanks. Uh, the rest of my questions have been asked and answered. The next question today comes from David Chiverini of Woodbush Securities. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks. Uh, follow up on the hotel book. You mentioned that loan modifications are going through at the end of the year, but hypothetically, if hotels remain, you know, empty until a vaccine is developed, which could be 12 to 18 months from now, at what point and under what scenario would you move to foreclose on the hotel properties? Uh, David, uh, if it came across as the end of the year, I meant the end. I, I thought I said the end of the quarter or during the second quarter. Um, if that's what you. So uh, yeah, yeah. The, what we're what we're looking for is we're looking for solutions that combine. You know, capital contribution from the from the borrower with our ability to give them a you know a deferral or um, or some some relief and um, and a modification that that takes this you know beyond three months beyond six months which we see a lot of the other competitors doing it seems like they're just handing out kind of three month deferrals and say well let's let's address this again in June or July we're not doing that we're trying to bridge to a to a longer timeline in terms of you know what does this look like. You know, I, I, you know, so, I mean, these borrowers, you know, ha they have obligations. We're, you know, we're going to be able to give them some relief on this type of thing. But, you know, and a lot of them have, you know, considerable resources to draw upon. So is there a situation whereby some of them become very stressed and, you know, we see migration, you know, down to, you know, special mention, down to substandard? I think that's certainly the case. What's it going to take for us to foreclose on one of these? Well, 
you know, we, you know, we have, you know, we have a, a value. We have our shareholders that we need to respond to, and we're going to be, you know, accountable to that, and we're going to be responding to that. That's why we think the loan to value is so important here, because, you know, if somebody isn't, if somebody doesn't want to be able to continue here or has to throw in the keys, then it's like, okay, well, as long as hotels overall haven't fallen, you know, more than forty percent of original value, we probably have very nominal risk of loss because because of where we are in the strong LTV. That's helpful. Thanks for that. And then shifting gears, you mentioned about how the Main Street lending program should benefit some of your larger customers. I was wondering, will you be able to swap out your existing loans for the new loan under the facility and essentially transfer the risk uh, to mm -hmm. the government? No, no, no. The program doesn't allow doesn't allow for that um, in terms of you, when you when you issue a Main Street lending program, it has to be a new disbursement. It can't pay off something that's already outstanding. Okay. And do you believe the program is big enough to make a difference? Uh, because looking at the SBA PPP program, that those funds were exhausted fairly quickly. Well, I mean, they were exhausted fairly quickly, and I guess it remains to be seen whether they're going to reauthorize that for another 250. I, I'm not sure that the process for the Main Street Lending Program is, is is going to be as complicated a pathway as it is for the Federal Reserve. You don't have to have two different you know parties from different you know opposite ends of this political spectrum to be able to unite on something and agree. You have to get the FOMC, the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System to agree on this. So I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it remains to be seen what the demand is. They put it out there at $600 billion. It seems like that's got some room to go. It obviously goes to much larger enterprises, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, two and a half billion in revenue, 10,000 employees. So we'll, we'll, we'll see about kind of what that looks like, but uh, I haven't heard anything about that, but I think they want to get it going and maybe see what the demand is before they, before they go on from there. But, you know, again, we expect to be early. We were early with Triple P. We got, you know, one and a half billion. If you look at the proportion of what we did in Triple P relative to our size to the overall banking community in the country, we had a much higher penetration than most institutions. And then the last one for me is in the slide deck, it was mentioned about 82% of the variable rate loans with floors are, are at those floors. Can you remind us what's the average life or average stated maturity of those loans? Well, the, the average maturity of our loan book is just under four years, and that, it's going to track pretty closely with that. Thanks very much. The next question today comes from Gary Tenner of DA Davidson. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks, guys. Good morning. I um, just wanted to ask a technical question on the PPP. Dell, I think you had mentioned that as those get funded, uh, they'll be on the balance sheet for up to six months. I thought the timeline for when uh, the bank or borrower could, I guess, apply to have the loan forgive was about seven weeks. Is that is there something different than, than I'm, so, I'm so, understanding that? Well, if, let, me, let me clarify a little bit. So you, you would obtain a triple P loan, and the portion of that that um, that is forgivable, i.e., that is used to cover, you know, employee compensation, certain elements of, you know, rent and other and other, you know, basic expenses. That, that's the part that's that that can be that can be forgiven by the SBA, and so that is going to be a, a shorter timeline. The actual PPP loans themselves are two years. So what we see is we see what was the usage. You know, somebody gets a loan for X amount. What is the usage of that? About two thirds of the of the amount used for these loans has been for something that should be ultimately forgivable because those funds are going to be used to support the, those particular items that are identified in the legislation. The, the, la the back third is something that isn't forgivable, and so that's going to be on a more of a, a term structure for two years. Okay, thanks. And, and the fees on that, uh, you'll be counting for them through spread income, or is that what that be? It, it'll go through spread income, and it'll be okay, front end loaded uh, because because of the the kind of the odd nature of how these loans are going to amortize with the with a payment forgiveness, and then and then the borrower responsible for the rest. Right, so it it would it would artificially inflate the margin, say in the second quarter, uh, and then have a lesser impact as they get paid off beyond that. Yeah, second um, and third. Yeah. So then, and then then just uh, follow up in terms of the pay downs. I think Ken, you mentioned uh, some pay downs from those 
of the loans that were drawn in March, you've seen some of the repayments. So um, could, could you maybe quantify what you've seen in terms of the repayments on some of those loans? Yeah, it, it's, it's been it's 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 been modest. I what I what I what I meant to say is we're not seeing additional draws of any significance, and there's been some modest you know payments. It seems to have been stable stabilized, and that echoes what I'm hearing from these other institutions. I think B of A made a particular comment about this. But if you look at you know where these corporate finance loans, are, you know who the syndicator is, it's J P Morgan, it's B of A, it's Wells Fargo, it's the larger institutions, and I think. What we're seeing really mirrors what, what they're what they're talking about. Thanks, Bill. The next question comes from Michael Young of SunTrust Robinson Humphrey. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks for taking the question. Um, maybe just to follow up, uh, Karen, on your comments about you know net charge offs and when they'd be realized. I guess maybe in particular, could you just talk about high level where you think those will come from at this point? Sounds like maybe you don't expect as much from hotel given the collateral base there, but would it be more tech and life sciences businesses um, with less collateral base or some of the CNI categories um, in particular, shared national credits or anything like that um, that maybe we're we're not seeing or focusing on right now? So I, I think I took a little bit of a step out there saying I just think charge-offs will be a little bit later. Um, my crystal ball isn't as clear to say which group is it uh, we're, are going to have the charge-offs. Um, and I, I don't feel comfortable really putting that out there at this time. Um, I just don't – it, things are changing so quickly um, that I will clearly be wrong. And uh, I just rather hold back my intuitive feel on that. But I do feel generally that charge-offs will come later in the year and not as early as people think. Okay. And then uh, maybe, Dale, just on the, the shared national credit book, I think that was a strategy that you guys had um, had in the past um, on a small basis. You know, maybe it, it gotten up to about a billion maybe in outstanding at one point. Can you just tell us the, the balance at this point and – Anything that we should be, you know, looking at there in terms of mitigating factors? Yeah, we're. I mean, we're probably at about a billion four. I mean, most of the draws that have come down have come down in in SNICs. Uh and uh, you know, as we've talked about in the past, this is a you know, uh, you know, kind of low investment grade portfolio. Uh, it, the the syndicators are, as I just mentioned, the you know the large uh, the large banking companies uh, that we've participated in. We've you know we we've. At times, you know, we've tried to we've tried to do so so that we can augment our ability to to push for deposits from some of these enterprises that are in our markets, and so we've taken um, a little piece of them. Okay, and then maybe just last one for me, just on the expenses. Um, obviously, a pretty decent step down this quarter um, related, to, I assume, lower comp um, expectations. But is that kind of a new uh, run rate that we should kind of base growth off of from here or, you know, any other, you know, factors that maybe shifted meaningfully with, uh, you know, kind of everyone working from home, et cetera? No, I think we're on a we're on a we're on a lower trajectory uh, from from where we were with this with the step down. We're continuing to um, do the necessary investments that we have in technology uh, to make sure our, our platform continues to support what we're doing today, which is basically executing on our in our business resumption continuity programs. Okay, that's all for me. Thanks. Okay. Well, it looks like we've um, exhausted all the uh, questions, so uh, we ran longer. We thank you for spending time with us. Um, we look forward to uh, talking to you again, and uh, we wish you um, uh, a good uh, weekend, health, and uh, and safety out there for everyone, and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you all. The conference is now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect.